On March 15th, the High Court in India's southern state of Karnataka upheld a ruling banning the hijab in schools and universities. Since the ban was first introduced, far-right mobs have reportedly been heckling young women wearing hijabs on their way to school. And now the gates to those schools and colleges have been shut to them, leaving the women vulnerable to violence. This decision is just the latest in a slew of laws and policies that discriminate against Indian Muslims and other minorities in the country. So can India still claim to be the world's largest democracy when minorities continue to be stripped of their human rights and face increasing attacks from Hindu supremacist mobs? That's our conversation this week on Upfront. Joining me to discuss the treatment of minorities in India are Rana Ayub, Indian journalist, opinion columnist with The Washington Post, and author of Gujarat Files, Anatomy of a Cover-Up, Shadok Alam, a lawyer for the Supreme Court of India, and Akar Patel, chair of Amnesty International India, and the author of Our Hindu Rashtra, What It Is, How We Got Here. Thank you all for joining me on Upfront. Rana, I'm going to start with you. Uh, on March 15th, the High Court in the state of Karnataka uh, upheld a ban on wearing hijab in school. Uh, the court argued that it is not, quote, essential to Islam and that they must foster a secular environment. Uh, for weeks, far-right mobs have been heckling women wearing hijab on the way to school. Uh, but the irony of this is that while there's a claim for secularism, uh, these mobs are wearing saffron scarves, a symbol associated with Hinduism, and they're shouting, Hail Lord Ram. Uh, is this really about secularism, or is this just an attack on Muslims? Well, Mark, everything that has been happening in, in India since 2014 in the garb of protecting Muslim women has been an attempt to kind of attack the Muslimness or and the religious practices and identity of people in this country. I mean, the Karnataka High Court, if I may say, was extremely disappointing. And these are girls who want to study, who want to get educated, and they are being, uh, you know, they are being deprived of their education just because they have asked for the right to wear the hijab. It basically points to India's continuous decline into this right-wing Hindu fundamentalism, where every Muslim practice now is not going to be questioned, whether it was CAA, whether it was not allowing Muslims to offer namaz um, in public, um, where, you know, they were heckled by right-wing uh, right fundamentalists. And now this, um, it, is, it is relentless. It is relentless to the point that we in India seems to seem to have normalized this everyday hate against the Muslim minority, where nothing actually surprises us anymore. I mean, this trauma and this despair, I think, is has now become a part of our life. And it only gets worse from here. Akar, uh, you're the chair of Amnesty International India. When you hear those types of words, everyday hate of Muslim citizens, as Rana said, uh, what do you make of it? What's your take? So there's been a series of laws that have targeted the economic, social, uh, and the cultural laws uh, rights of uh, Muslims. Uh, political rights were taken away from them uh, before this, uh, India doesn't has uh, 200 million Muslims, uh, but it doesn't have a single chief minister, which would be the same as a governor in the U.S. Um, we've got 303 people in our uh, legislative assembly, the Lok Sabha, which would be your U.S. House of Congress, none of whom is a Muslim from from the ruling party. So there is deliberate political apartheid. They're, they're kept apart. They're not given tickets to contest, uh, and they're kept separately from what the uh, political system does. There's been a series of laws as well that look at uh, how the state can harass and bully Muslims. We have reversed the burden of proof also on marriage. So India has uh, criminalized in uh, seven of its states of interfaith marriage between Muslims and Hindus. And an adult woman's testimony that she uh, changed her faith of free volition is insufficient evidence for the state. It is for the man she's marrying and the family she's marrying into to prove to a local officer that there was no coercion involved. The state holds the right to undo the marriage, even ones that have children. This is the law in this country. So I'm glad you brought this up, because this speaks to a legal matter, uh, Shadok. Uh, I want to ask you about this, because in India, you have Article 14 of the Constitution, uh, which guarantees equality before the law. Uh, Article 15 prohibits discrimination based on religion, and Article 25 guarantees the right to freely profess, practice, and propagate religion. Uh, it would seem to me that these bans 
and these everyday actions uh, that we're just talking about uh, are examples of contravention of the law. Uh, how is this judgment able to pass the high court? And how in everyday life are we not able to see a contradiction between what's happening on the ground and these sort of broader ideals of, of, the, of the nation's constitution? The judgment, Mark, couldn't have gone any other way. Because the, in the way that this whole hijab debate was framed, the question before the court was, is it, is it an essential religious practice? Is it the core of the Muslim religion to wear a hijab? And the court said that it's not. But it's a very odd, unimaginative framing of the problem. The state has said to the court that we believe in freedom and dignity. And we want to encourage practices that are not derogatory to women rights. And we want to encourage individual choices. The presumption is that all of this, the wearing of the hijab breaches. But the court never examined any of it. The court did not go into the matter of whether girls wear hijab by individual choice or not. The court didn't examine whether the wearing of the hijab or not wearing of the hijab breaches freedom and dignity. The court just endorsed that point of view. And without any kind of examination, the court has held that to wear a hijab is a violation of freedom and dignity. So we will not have Indian citizens seen in public like that. And what the court therefore does is to give to the public, give to the Indian public, an idea of who a good citizen is and an idea of who an aberration is. And therefore, you have cases across India where, where people are snatching hijabs from young girls and young women. And they, they, they think that this is a form of correction that they're indulging in because they have the court's endorsement. So to my mind, the, the, the primary thing that this judgment has done is to, is to constitute an idea of a good Indian citizen. I, I want to push on this because, again, it speaks to the treatment of Muslims in the country. Uh, Rana, uh, this year marks the 20th anniversary of the Gujarat mas massacre, uh, the anti-Muslim pogrom uh, that happened during Prime Minister Modi's tenure as chief minister of Gujarat. Uh, years later, we're now seeing Hindu nationalists calling for a genocide and an ethnic cleansing of Muslims, and complete silence is coming from the government. Uh, what has happened over the last 20 years that's allowed this kind of anti-Muslim hate to spread? Uh, and where does Hindu supremacist ideology fit into all of this conversation? Well, Mark, Narendra Modi, <clears throat> Narendra Modi has been the poster boy of Hindu nationalism. In fact, he has been sold as this Hindu leader who will bring back the reign of Hindu supremacy. Let us not for a moment believe that Indians who are voting for Narendra Modi are voting for development or voting for constitutional or fundamental rights. Let us, for, let us not even for a minute believe that the entire proceeding that was going in Karnataka High Court and all that is taking place, this is nothing to do with the constitutional or the fundamental right of a Muslim woman. This is an attack on the Muslim identity, which has continued. The, uh, the brazen attack where Muslim women and their hijab is being, is, you know, is being uh, taken off by men in public. Um, you saw similar attempts in 2002 when Mr. Modi was chief minister of Gujarat. I, it's just a repeat. I mean, honestly, nothing surprises me anymore because this is the culture that we are now used to. It has been normalized to the extent where the average Hindu has been told that the Muslim in India is taking your resource, is taking what was rightfully yours, has been appeased over the years, and Mr. Modi is bringing back the Hindu pride, and, and which is why he keeps on winning elections despite non-performance. He has made the Muslim the enemy of the state for the average Hindu. This is being done by the tacit support of those in power. Wow, like that, that idea of enemy of the most, state, yeah. that idea of enemy of the state is really important one because Human Rights Watch says that authorities in India have already adopted laws that systematically discriminate against Muslims, but also that prejudice uh, has infiltrated independent institutions like the police, like the courts. Uh, for example, after the 2020 Delhi riots where Hindu mobs massacred 53 people, mainly Muslims, uh, an independent investigation discovered evidence during the riots showed that several policemen were beating injured Muslim men, five of them, lying on the street, forcing them to sing the Indian national anthem just to prove their patriotism. I mean, you're a lawyer. I got to ask you. Uh, First of all, beyond the absurdity of this actual incident, 
Does India still have an independent judiciary? I think it does, Mark. We do have an independent judiciary somewhat, but it's the, the, the system is getting in the way. And I'll explain myself. You, you, you mentioned the, the Delhi pogrom, and that sort of emerged from very widespread protests that were happening in the wake of the, the special uh, regime brought in by this government, the Citizen Amendment Act and the National Register for Citizens, which sort of reconfigures the idea of citizenship, which left Muslims very scared. And Muslim students and Muslims were generally out on the streets protesting. In December of 2019, the police entered one of our central universities in Delhi, Jamia Millia Islamia, at night and assaulted students. The students went to court the next day, challenging police action. And we were before the Supreme Court. What fell from the Supreme Court was, first get off the streets and stop pelting stones, and then we'll help you. So this was, this was an oral remark which had no basis in law. It had no basis in fact, because you, you, you can't say to students that I will, I will protect you from disproportionate police action only if you stop protesting. But what it did was it, it molded popular sentiment. When he said stop pelting stones, there was a visual linkage made between Muslim protesters in Delhi, in Kashmir, in Palestine, everywhere. And that's when we started to hear about the global conspiracy. So what does it do? What, how, how does it again form the Muslim subject in India? The Muslim subject is seen as somebody who's just always agitated, who's very prone to violence, who's always conspiring, and who's always disloyal. And on top of that, just the fact that you're out on the streets, there's not even any allegation that you were armed, but just the fact that you were out on the streets Muslim bare bodies are now being equated with lethal weapons. Hmm. Uh, Akar, uh, the organization Genocide Watch has sounded the alarms, uh, warning that a full-fledged genocide against Muslims could happen in India. Uh, the president of the organization says, uh, our view is that it is a huge danger in India because it won't be the state that carries out any genocide. It will be mobs. Do you worry about a genocide in India? And more specifically, are these mobs being emboldened, if not outright supported by the state? The answer to the second question is yes, that the state does support and uh, embolden mobs in uh, India. And we have examples. So the state has let go its uh, monopoly over violence in parts of the capital city of India. So there are parts of this uh, city, Delhi, where I am, where Muslims have been allocated space by the state to pray on Friday, where mobs have come and vetoed it and forced them to get off, and the state has uh, succumbed to the mob. Um, similarly, in parts of this country, there are spaces in which Muslims vend food, vend eggs, where mobs have asked them to leave those spaces, and the state has uh, agreed with the mobs and let go of its monopoly over violence. So I do agree with the idea that in India, the primary aspect of uh, mass violence, which is that the state uh, abandons its role, is in place. Do I fear uh, the, the fact that a genocide might take place? I do. I think that what is happening in India is slow burn, that every day we are told something or the other that deals with how Muslims are villainous. Uh, and every day, the state doesn't respond to come in uh, and act against those who are saying these things. I think that the rhetoric in the public spaces in India is quite poisonous, and I think it's very dangerous. The size of the state in South Asia is very small. We don't have the capacity to be able to control mobs once they are unleashed. It appears to me that under the BJP, what the government of India is trying to do is unleash mobs rather than rein them in. Rana, attacks from far-right Hindu nationalists have extended to other minority groups as well, uh, like Christians. Uh, in Madhya Pradesh last year, in January, Hindu nationalists stormed a church shouting Hindu supremacist slogans and punched pastors in the head. They've also burned down churches and smashed statues of Christ. Uh, looking at the situation, many would think whoever is not Hindu is under threat. Has India become a country without religious freedom? 
Well, uh, Mark, the attack on the Christian minority, just like the attack on Muslim minority, is not a recent phenomenon. Uh, back in the day, uh, in the 90s, Graham Staines, who was a missionary, was burnt alive with his two children in a car by a Hindu nationalist. And one of the people, one of who's accused of conspiring this is now a minister in Mr. Modi's government. Father Stan Swami, another Jesuit priest who was fighting for the rights of tribals, he was arrested for sedition. Um, this, he's, he's, he was a man in his 80s. He was not even given bail to come out to 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 receive the medical treatment, that man died because of the complicity of the state. And the unfortunate bit is that the average Indian does not see these crimes as criminal, as fundamentalist enough. I was watching the Kashmir Files, which is a film that is now being used as a propaganda material all over the country. I left the theater in 25 minutes because the visuals, uh, you know, uh, where, uh, of Muslims in skull caps are uh, brutalizing innocent Hindus at a time that we are living in, and there were people in the theater who were cheering every time a Muslim was attacked, and I was, I had to leave the theater in 25 minutes because the the lady sitting next to me was abusing Muslims, and I got into a, you know, a, an argument, and they they literally made me leave. And when I was leaving, she said, "Yeah, go to Pakistan." I mean. If it can happen to me, who is an upper middle class privileged woman, imagine what happens to Muslims who do not have the same privilege. So many of us are saying in India that we are, yeah. So so let's talk about the Kashmir Files. Uh, The film portrays the exodus of Kashmiri Hindus in the 90s, and some say the film skewed account of this history is fanning anti-Muslim sentiment. Uh, In addition to what Rana described, uh, there are reports of audience members in theaters across India Uh, are standing up at the end of the film and shouting slogans like, shoot the traitors, kill them, referring to Muslims, of course. Uh, Prime Minister Modi has praised the movie, and several BJP-ruled states have made the film tax-free. Sharuk, to what extent do you believe uh, messages like this are considered hate speech as opposed to freedom of speech? And and where do you draw the line? That's a difficult question also, Mark. See, the the law is is very, very clear about what is hate speech or what is not protected speech. And that is speech that is directly inciting violence, the spark in a powder keg test. But the, the problem with hate speech is that it's it's never that. It's, it's never just a spark in the powder keg. Hate speech is always cumulative. You, you build on it over, over years and years of sort of portraying a community in a particular way. But... Unfortunately, it's difficult for the law to then penalize somebody who's, who's building on a cumulative discourse of, of hatred. And I think that is, the, that is the problem that the Indian courts are struggling with. So Kashmir Files in itself is just a very badly made film, a propaganda film. It, it, it is a problem. Can we ban the film on its own? Or can we ban the the activity, the interactive activity that is going on around it? Absolutely. Uh, Rana, I see you uh, looking to jump in there. Yeah, uh, Mark, this is not a propaganda film. This is not like, I mean, that's the only time I'll differ with Shah Rukh. It's, it's, it's not a badly made film. It is a very well thought of curated hate speech with the intention of spreading hatred against Muslims. In an ideal world, the Supreme Court of India should have should have literally given orders to not screen this film. It is living, breathing hate against the Muslims. There is an actual problem. Kashmiri pundits were forced to flee out of the valley. But the way this has been misconstrued in the film, it is leading to uh, hatred against Muslims in a, in a way that I have not witnessed before. We've been talking a lot about Muslim populations, but there are also many non-Muslim populations who are being discriminated against in the country as well. Uh, Akar, uh, even among Hindus, Uh, There is vast discrimination uh, against Dalits, for example, who are designated as the lowest caste uh, in India's caste system. Uh, According to the National Campaign on Dalit Human Rights, a crime is committed against a Dalit every 18 minutes. 13 Dalits are murdered per week, and three Dalit women are raped every single day. Uh, Just to give you an example, in 2019, a young man was beaten to death by upper caste people for simply eating in front of them at a wedding reception. That same year, a minor was tied up with a rope and also beaten to death for trying to enter a temple. Uh, The conviction rates for crimes against Dalits remain very low, though. 
Uh, is this all a reflection of religious nationalism? Or is this something more structural, more systemic? It's more structural and it is more systemic and has been going on for quite a while. I don't think that we should attribute to the BJP things that have been present in India for decades. Certainly the uh, abuse of the rights uh, of uh, Dalits, uh, who are called scheduled castes in the constitution, and the Aboriginal peoples of India, called the Scheduled Tribes, has been going on for decades, if not for centuries. I think what is happening today, uh, and has been happening for some time, is that the state is enthusiastic about enforcing those violations. So, for instance, uh, the Dalits, who are the Scheduled Castes, they lose their rights to uh, affirmative action, what is called reservation in India, should they change their faith. Uh, this is uh, true also of the scheduled tribes, the uh, native peoples of this country who have a form of constitutional uh, protection by law, but which they lose should they change their faith. If I may add to that, Mark, may I just add Please. something to what Akka said? I agree with Akka that it's it's we've always have had structural violence and we've always had explicit violence on Dalits, on women, uh, on tribal people, all of that. But earlier, I thought this operated on the margins of the state. These were these were feudal things that happened. I think that has changed now. The viol violence against Muslims now and even Dalits now. It's, it's unapologetic, and it's unapologetic because the courts, the media, public discourse all paints them as people who are outsider, outsiders, who, don't, who, who are aberrations. So the, the state and the mobs take, in, take it upon themselves to correct those aberrations. So this violence, in fact, is seen to be in the service of the nation. You are constituting a better nation state by being violent against these communities, as opposed to earlier when it was, it was seen to be outside the idea of a modern state. Well, Rana, we've been talking about uh, violence against minorities and a legal system that's allowing all of this to happen. Uh, if this stuff continues, what does that hold for the future? That's a good question, Mark. I wish I had an answer to this. As a Muslim myself, I feel like, you know, as a privileged Muslim and an upper middle class Muslim, I must confess, who's, who, I mean, the chances of my relatives and my family members of getting lynched on the streets for eating beef are much, much lesser uh, than, than a lower middle class Muslim or a trader. I mean, what more do Indian Muslims need to see and hear? To, to, to have faith in this country where apartheid and calls for genocide are becoming a part of our daily life. So there is, I wish me and other Muslims in the country could see some hope or could see some semblance of hope. Unfortunately, people in this country, the majority, seem to be rebelling in this hate that is being extended against Muslims. And it is happening, this, this hate is being emboldened due to the complicity of the well-meaning people in this country who are not speaking loud enough. Wow. I want to thank you all for joining me on Upfront. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. In this episode, some of our guests implied that members of India's ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, along with members of state governments and law enforcement, have been complicit in discrimination and even violence against minorities, either through direct action or lack of adequate response. We put these statements to senior members of the BJP, the Prime Minister's Office, and the Ministry for Home Affairs, asking them for their perspective or a specific response. At the time of this recording, we have yet to receive any acknowledgement of our messages. Allies of the BJP point to statements made by Prime Minister Narendra Modi, such as the one in 2019 made to members of Parliament. He said, We have to move shoulder to shoulder without discriminating on the basis of caste, sect, and religion. Following the Delhi riots in February 2020, which left 53 people dead, 40 of them Muslims, Modi tweeted, Peace and harmony are central to our ethos. I appeal to my sisters and brothers of Delhi to maintain peace and brotherhood at all times. It is important that there is calm and normalcy restored at the earliest. Should we hear back from India's government once this program has aired, we will be sure to post their response online. That's our show. Thank you for watching. Upfront, we'll be back next week.